Hello, Biology 100 students. Welcome to our lecture on muscles and muscle tissue. In reality, we're not going to be spending a lot of time learning the muscles per se. I would like to do that with you in an in-class activity if everything goes well. So today, we're going to learn more about the physiology of muscle action and how muscles generate force. Okay, if you remember a couple lectures ago when we were talking about tissues, we talked about three different types of muscle tissue. And the first one is up here on top, and that's skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle is a found attached to our skeleton, right? And it helps us to move our arms and legs and so forth. And skeletal muscle fibers are really long. Uh, and remember, they have these striations in there, these lines going down through them. And they also have many nuclei. So they're multiple nucleated. And finally, they're voluntary, right? We can voluntarily contract skeletal muscle. In contrast, cardiac muscle is found in the heart, and it is involuntary. We can't voluntarily contract our heart. Um, and then the cells are also striated. They're a lot smaller, and they only have one to two nuclei. And then finally, we have smooth muscle. And smooth muscle is found primarily in blood vessels and the intestine. Uh, it is also involuntary. And because it's smooth, it has no striations in there. So smooth muscle helps to propel food through the digestive tract, etc. Okay, let's talk about some of the functions of muscle tissue. We said before that skeletal muscle is there to produce body movements, and that's true. It also helps to stabilize body positions, keep us upright from falling over. And when we talk about smooth muscle, it definitely helps us to regulate organ volumes, right? It moves food through the digestive tract, etc. cetera. Uh, it's also important uh, for producing heat. When we talk about skeletal muscle contraction, it actually generates a fair amount of heat. So if it's really cold outside or you're in the ocean and you've been in there too long and you start to uh, get too cold, you'll notice you'll start to shiver and that shivering generates a little bit of heat. But simply just going to the gym, if you're working out, you'll notice that that generates a lot of heat as well. So muscles can definitely generate heat. Okay, now let's go over some of the properties of muscle tissue. First of all, we know that muscle tissue is excitable. It responds to chemicals released from our nerve cells. It's also conductive. Just like electrical wires, it has the ability to propagate electrical charges. And when we talk about, for example, cardiac muscle, it can even generate electrical charges. Uh, muscular tissue is also contractile, right? That's what it does. It forcefully shortens. And of course, muscle tissue can also extend. It can stretch back to its original shape, although not forcefully. And finally, it's elastic, right? We can stretch muscle tissue, and then it snaps back to its original shape. OK, I want to point out now that we're moving on to talk more about the skeletal muscles in the body rather than the cardiac muscles or the smooth muscle. We'll talk about those when we get to the cardiovascular system and the digestive system, respectively. So muscles that we're talking about in the skeleton are skeletal muscles, and these are organs. They're organs because they contain multiple tissues. For example, your biceps brachii muscle here contains the muscle tissue there. It contains connective tissue. It contains blood vessels. It contains fat tissue. And there's also a lot of nervous tissue in there. I don't know if you've ever been at like KFC or something, and you're eating fried chicken, and as you pull back and take a bite, you feel something like gray and greasy fall across your chin. Uh, chances are that might be a nerve or a blood vessel, but the point is that that chicken is actually an organ in there. A meat uh, is a muscle, and the muscle is an organ, and it has lots of different tissues. Okay, this slide just shows a diagram of muscle anatomy. So first off, we have our muscle. This is probably our biceps brachii muscle. And if we look within that muscle, if it's been cut, we can see uh, bundles of fibers. And this bundle of fibers is called a fascicle. A fascicle is a bundle of muscle fibers surrounded by connective tissue. Now, it's important you remember now that a muscle fiber is the same thing as a muscle cell. So when I say fiber, you think cell. Okay. So we have this fascicle, which is a bundle of muscle fibers or muscle cells. And then within that fascicle, we have our individual muscle cell, also known as a fiber. Now, we can look within that cell and see what's within the cell. And muscle cells have special contractile organelles called myofibrils. So myofibrils are special contractile protein cables within the muscle cell itself. OK, let's take a closer look at the muscle cell. And again, this is skeletal muscle here. So here we can see those giant myofibrils. And their job was to contract. They contract forcefully. And then those myofibrils are divided into repeated segments called sarcomeres. The sarcomere is the smallest contractile unit uh, of a muscle cell. So these sarcomeres individually contract. And because each myofibril is made up of hundreds or thousands of sarcomeres, the whole thing contracts a lot. Okay. Other things we find within that muscle cell is we probably find a lot of mitochondria, right? Uh, muscle cells are energetically very expensive, right? We burn a lot of ATP in there. And so we're going to have a lot of these uh, mitochondria in there to supply that ATP. The other thing that we find in there is an organ called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum sounds like endoplasmic reticulum, and it is. It's a derivative of that. But this organelle is designed to store and release calcium. Because as it turns out, calcium is needed to signal uh, muscle contraction. And we'll talk about how that works. 
OK, so here we are, the sarcomere. Remember, the sarcomere was the smallest contractile unit of a muscle cell. So the sarcomere is one layer smaller than the myofibrils. Now, within that sarcomere, we find two different types of proteins uh, called actin and myosin. Myosin is the red ones right here in the middle. Actin are the ones on the outside. And you can see that they're overlapping right now. They're forming something called a cross bridge. OK, so here is a slide of a little bit of anatomical terminology. I'm not going to go through it now. I'll be going through that as I go through the different slides. But be sure to refer back to the PowerPoint if you have any questions about what something is. OK, so here are the different fibers that we have inside the, the sarcomere. Remember, the sarcomere was the smallest contractile unit of a muscle cell. And it's found one layer below the myofibrils. So the sarcomere has in there our myosin molecule. And the myosin has these little golf club heads on there because myosin's golf club heads are going to go into the holes on the actin molecule, right? And it's sort of there into there. OK, so actin is the molecule that myosin will be grabbing a hold of. Now, whether or not myosin can grab a hold of actin depends on whether or not calcium is present. When we don't have calcium present in the sarcomere, there is actually uh, another molecule that is covering up the binding sites on the actin molecule, so we can't get our little myosin heads in there. Now, on the other hand, when calcium is present, it causes this molecule, the tropomyosin molecule, to move out of the way so that myosin can then bind with those special receptor sites on the actin molecule. And that binding is called a cross bridge. OK, so the sliding filament hypothesis describes how we think muscles contract. Basically, it's that myosin is the stationary molecule in the middle of the sarcomere. And then when calcium and ATP are present, myosin can grab a hold of the actin on either side and start pulling it towards it. And when it's pulling it towards it, the sarcomere will then forcefully shorten. OK, it's important to note, in order for a sarcomere to contract completely, we have to go through multiple contraction and relaxation cycles with our actin and myosin. So I'm going to simulate myosin, and then this yellow rod here will be actin. So in the first step here, our myosin heads are going to cock back using the energy stored in ATP to generate some potential energy within the myosin molecule. So those myosin heads on the myosin will cock back uh, like a hammer on a gun, and that will store potential energy. So that's what I'm doing now. I've taken my ATP, and then I've cocked back my myosin head. OK, the next step over here is we are going to bind to that actin molecule using the myosin head and form something called a cross bridge. So cross bridge formation. So watch this. <gasps> cross bridge. That's what happened. As simple as that. So that's step number two. Now step number three is something called the power stroke. So you can see that way down here. So the power stroke is just simply myosin. After grabbing a hold of that actin molecule like this, it goes uh, and pulls it towards it a little bit. OK, that was the power stroke. And then number four is I'm going to let go of that again. I detach after binding to ATP. And then I start the whole sequence all over again. Cock back myosin head, cross bridge formation, power stroke, detach. And so this happens in a little ratcheting motion. And it takes several times of contraction to completely shorten the sarcomere. OK, now we're going to go through the steps that are required in order for contraction to begin. We've talked about the sliding filament hypothesis, that is, myosin grabbing hold of actin. But what happened before that? So there's a whole lot of steps that we're going to talk about in the next few slides. I've tried to uh, make it simplified and give you a simplified diagram. So we're going to work by it step by step. OK, so first thing here is this is a diagram that I drew, so don't make fun of it. Uh, this is a idealized muscle cell right here. OK, and within that muscle cell, we have our sarcomere. This is the sarcomere that would have our myosin right there and then our actin right there. And this is the ends of the sarcomere, the Z disks or whatever you call them. OK, so. Up here on the top, we have that yellow structure is a neuron axon. Remember that skeletal muscles contract only when we send nerve impulses towards them. So they're voluntarily contracted. We have to stimulate them with a neuron. The other things I want to show you in here is this is our sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is where we are storing our calcium molecules. And remember, calcium is needed in order for myosin to be able to grab a hold of actin and form that cross bridge. OK, and then we have the sarcolemma. This is just the cell membrane of the uh, muscle cell. And this is something called the T-tubule. And that's going to allow a charge to come down. So let's look at the steps in a step-by-step -step fashion. So first of all, we have a nerve impulse that arrives at our muscle cell coming down the axon at the axon terminus, right? And that came from our brain or spinal cord that said, I want to contract this muscle cell. OK, the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to release a neurotransmitter from our motor neuron. And here you can see motor neuron is releasing the neurotransmitter. It diffuses across that synaptic cleft. And the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to generate a second uh, action potential or second electrical current along the surface of the sarcolemma, which was the surface of our muscle cell membrane. Remember that I said that muscle cells are conductive. They can conduct an electrical impulse. And then eventually that uh, electrical charge is going to travel along the membrane and go down these perpendicular tubes called the T-tubules. 
Now it's going to go down to the T-tubules and it's going to approach this other organelle right here, which was our sarcoplasmic reticulum. In response to that electrical charge, the sarcoplasmic reticulum will go bleh, and it will barf up that calcium, freeing it up into the muscle cell and allowing it to diffuse to our sarcomere, which is where the myosin and actin are located. Okay, and finally, we're going to start to see myosin grabbing a hold of actin. What do we call that? We called it a cross bridge. So remember, there's several cycles in order for uh, myosin to be able to fully uh, close the, uh, the sarcomere and, and make it as small as possible. So we have to grab a hold, uh, form our cross bridge, uh, have our power stroke, let go, et cetera, and keep doing that. And so that's what happens right here and here and here. Okay, so this is the sequence of events needed in order to have muscle contraction. All right, so you've heard about muscle twitches before when you've talked about, you know, like my eye twitches and stuff like that. And usually you're thinking about something that is involuntary, that just happens for whatever reason. Maybe you're low on calcium. But think of how fast that twitch is. It's instantaneous. Well, that kind of twitch is also involved in voluntary muscular contraction. So let's talk about the three phases of muscle contraction. Remember, we always need a nerve impulse to stimulate a muscle contraction in skeletal muscles. So we have a nerve impulse, and then nothing happens. We have a latent phase, a contraction phase, and a relaxation phase. So let's talk about those phases. Okay, so this is a myogram right here. It shows the time in milliseconds on the x-axis, and on the y-axis it shows the force of contraction. So as we go up, the force of contraction goes up, and this is just showing time. Now, I want to point some things out. This arrow right here, the black arrow, is indicating when the nerve impulse arrives at the muscle. So as soon as the nerve impulse arrives at the muscle, nothing happens yet to contraction. There's actually a latent period or a delay because there's all those chemical things we were just talking about that need to happen before that sarcomere can contract, right? We had to have a release of neurotransmitter. We had to form a second uh, electrical potential in the cell membrane, had to go down the T-tubules, had to release the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or release the calcium. Calcium had to bind to the sarcomere. All that stuff had to happen. So it takes some time, and that's why we have a latent period. Okay, after the latent period, we have a brief contraction. So the force goes up. And then we have relaxation, force goes down. Now look at the time here. This took about 50 or 60 milliseconds. A millisecond is one one thousandth of a second. So the point here is, this is a very short you know, twitch. Uh, you can't really do much with that much. Try to pick something up in 50 milliseconds. It's not possible. So this is not anything we can use to do usable work. So let's talk about how we can take something like this and make it a functional muscle contraction so we can actually do work. Okay. In order to do that, we're going to go through a process called wave summation. So you can see a description of wave summation right here. Uh, basically, it involves repeated stimulation of a muscle before it gets time to uh, relax so that we have a longer and stronger contraction, and that's called a tetanus. So let's take a look at how wave summation happens. I'm going to explain a little bit about this graph here. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see that we have these little blue bumps, and those signify when a nerve impulse arrives at our muscle cell. And I can't quite point all the way here, but here you can see a blue bump, and then there's a contraction, right? There's a delay. And remember, that delay was called the latent period. Now, if you look all the way on that side, on your left-hand side, you can see that there's one single impulse, then there's a delay, and then there's a twitch. And if we send two impulses, we get a double twitch. If that double twitch happens before we fully relaxed, you can see that second contraction is stronger, and the overall time of contraction is longer. And that's how wave summation works. If we just sent one signal and then contraction, relaxation, and waited, and then sent a second one, we would just get two individual twitches. But if we stimulate that muscle multiple times before it relaxes, we get this stair step-like uh, thing called wave summation. So we get a stronger contraction and also a longer contraction. And eventually, if we keep sending signals to it again and again and again, we get this solid uh, muscle contraction called tetanus. Now tetanus, you think, oh, that's a disease. I don't want to get that sharp nail, rusty nail. It's not what we're talking about here. Tetanus, in this sense, is just sustained smooth muscle contraction. That's what I'm doing right there. Oh, tetanus. Now, unfortunately, because this is an online class, we don't really get to do a lab with it. But usually in my human anatomy lab, we actually hook students up to an electrical sort of like TENS unit. We shock them with an electrical charge and get them to involuntarily uh, crush a paper cup uh, through the process of wave summation. So pretty cool. All right, let's switch gears and talk about something called the motor unit. The motor unit is one motor neuron, so one neuron that controls muscle cells and all the muscle cells that neuron controls. Because in most cases, one neuron controls more than one muscle cell. 
So here you can see an example of an axon that's branching off a fairly large uh, motor neuron, and it's going to multiple muscle fibers. So the point here is when this axon fires off a nerve impulse, all the fibers that are connected to it are going to contract. There's no choice about that. So it's kind of like having a light switch that's hooked up to multiple lights. Uh, when you turn that light switch on, all three lights come on if there's th three lights attached to it. Okay, so this slide just shows a representation of a motor unit. Remember, a motor unit was a single uh, motor neuron and all the fibers that it controls, so all the muscle fibers it controls. So this is a single muscle neuron, or a motor neuron, and this is the three uh, muscle fibers it controls. So when this motor neuron forms an action potential, when an electrical charge forms within it, it's going to cause the contraction of all three of these muscle fibers. Now let's look at another representation. This one has four muscle fibers. So when it fires off a nerve impulse, all four of those fibers will contract. OK, what about this one? Uh, this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, different muscle fibers. And you can see that some of them are very, very big, and some are not so big. So when this particular neuron forms an action potential, all eight of those muscle fibers will contract. So which one of these motor units do you think is strongest? The first one, the second one, or the third one? If you say the third one, you're correct. It has more muscle fibers that it's controlling. And you can obviously see that some of those muscle fibers are bigger in the diameter than the other one. So that's the one that's going to be the strongest uh, motor unit. OK, so in this case of muscle fibers, size does matter. We have sometimes we have little skinny fibers, and sometimes we have big, thick fibers. So the skinny fibers are the first ones that we call up or recruit to do a job. For example, if I'm looking at this remote control on the desk and I'm saying, oh, I want to pick that up, do you think I'm using all my muscle fibers and my biceps to do that? No, I'm probably just using a few fibers because it's very, very light. So this process of choosing which fibers uh, are contracting is called recruitment. So initially, we go with our little skinny fibers. On the other hand, if we're lifting something very, very heavy, we're going to start to call up first our skinny fibers, but eventually our large diameter fibers that are very, very strong. So I'll give you an example here. You've probably been at the gym and probably lifted uh, on a weight bench or something like that. Now, initially, you probably just did the bar itself. And most of us can do nice, clean reps with a bar, 15 or 20 reps. But then imagine working out a little bit more and adding more and more weight. And eventually, you get to a point where you can just barely lift it. What does that look like? When you're seeing these people lifting these bars, there's this shaking thing that's going on, right? The reason it's shaking is because we're calling up the largest and strongest motor units that are lots of muscle fibers, and they contract and relax very quickly. And so you're seeing this jerky movement as individual motor units are recruited and contract and then fall out and fatigue and relax. So that's why we get that jerky muscle movement. OK, so there's several different factors that affect the strength and length of muscle contraction. One was the number of motor units stimulated, right? Initially, when we're doing a small contraction, we don't need all the motor units. We only call up some of the muscle fibers. The other thing is the size of the muscle fibers. Large diameter fibers are stronger than uh, small diameter fibers. And finally is the frequency of stimulation. Remember, wave summation is the repeated stimulation of a muscle cell. And if we stimulate it repeatedly, we get a stronger and a longer contraction. The other thing is the degree of muscle stretch. Depending on how stretched a joint is or the muscle is, we can get a stronger or a weaker contraction. Think about those guys that are doing like the deadlift, and they're picking up a, a, a barbell or dumbbell like this, and it's like 300 pounds. When they initially stand up, they'll kind of throw their arms out. And that's in order to get the ideal angle there between uh, the forearm and, and the brachium in order to be able to do efficient lifting. OK, now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about muscle fiber physiology. Now, within your own body, you have a mixture of what we call slow twitch and fast twitch fibers. Because this is Hawaii, I'm actually going to use fishy examples. And I was a fish biologist before I was a teacher here at Windward, so I love to talk about fish. So the first type of fiber we have is something called a slow oxidative fiber. Now, the reason we say it's slow is the enzyme that helps to break down the energy in ATP is slow. OK, that's the only thing slow about it. Uh, it's oxidative, so it requires a lot of oxygen, but oxygen also makes the energy extraction more efficient. Okay? And the fibers themselves are skinny and weak. Now, that sounds like, oh, this fiber's crap, right? Why do we want those? But the good things about these slow oxidative fibers is they have lots of mitochondria, right, to extract that ATP, and lots of myoglobin. Now, myoglobin is a pigment like hemoglobin. It's a red pigment, and it's what gives the ahi steaks its red coloration. That's because it binds to oxygen. And because we can bind to all this oxygen, we are a very high endurance muscle. Right? Think about ahi and how long they swim and how far they swim. 
they never stop swimming. They're swimming their whole freaking lives. And so these are very uh, high endurance muscles. We say that the fibers are individually uh, skinny and weak, but yeah, I still can't outswim an ahi. So remember the slow oxidative is a relative term. The point is slow oxidative muscle is, uh, has a slow ATP enzyme, but it's actually a very good for endurance. Okay, our next type of fiber is something called fast glycolytic. Now, fast glycolytic fibers are fast. They have a fast ATP splitting enzyme. Uh, on the other hand, they don't have many mi mitochondria. And that's because they're extracting a lot of ATP without the aid of oxygen. So they don't use oxygen for the most part. They're anaerobic, a uh, little myoglobin in there. And the reason they, they look like they do, that they tend to look pink or even white, is they have very little myoglobin. And remember, myoglobin was that pigment that helped to bind to oxygen. They also have a very weak blood flow. So not a lot of blood flow in there, but they do have these huge honking cells that are very very strong and powerful. So strong, powerful, fast contraction, but it tires very quickly. So an example here of a fish that uses primarily uh, fast glycolytic muscle would be something like a tilapia, right? Think about where in Hawaii you see a tilapia, right? Down the alawai. What are tilapia doing? If you startle them, they'll go over there and they'll stop. You don't see tilapia swimming across ocean basins, so you still can't probably outswim a tilapia, but the point is they have muscle that can contract very quickly and generate a burst of force, but it's gonna tire very, very quickly. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at a chicken and show you where we'd find fast glycolytic and slow oxidative fibers. So first of all, um, chicken breast up here, chicken thighs down there. Now what does a chicken use more, the breast or the thighs? Now chickens can fly, right? But they don't fly that far. If you startle a chicken, it might fly 25 yards or something like that. So as a result, the muscle that runs the wings up here, the breast muscle, is probably gonna be fast glycolytic muscle. It's good for short bursts of energy, short bursts of contraction, but again, chickens don't fly you know, long distances. So there's no myoglobin in here, and that's why we call this chicken meat white meat, so no myoglobin to speak of. But if you take a look at the chicken thighs, they're a lot darker, right? This is the dark meat that Americans, we don't like so much, I don't know why, but the dark meat here has lots of myoglobin. So this would be the slow oxidative muscle, the muscle that uh, individually has skinny and weak fibers, but we have lots of myoglobin, we have lots of blood flow, and so these things are designed for repeated use and uh, don't tire very easily. Okay, let's shift gears now and talk about running, right? So running uses muscle fibers, right? We're using our legs and there are quadriceps muscles and also our hamstrings. The question is, are we using fast glycolytic or are we using slow oxidative? Well, it depends on what kind of running we're doing. If we look at a long distance runner, somebody that's running a 26 mile marathon, they're probably using primarily their uh, slow oxidative fibers, right? Slow oxidative fibers or the red fibers have lots of myoglobin. And even though they're individually very weak, they have a lot of endurance because of the blood flow and the myoglobin and also all the mitochondria. On the other hand, somebody that's just doing like a 50 yard dash or something like that, they're probably relying more on the uh, fast uh, glycolytic muscles, right? If they're not running very far, uh, they only have to use the, the fast twitch muscle. And that fast twitch muscle, even though it tires very quickly, uh, it might be enough to get through something like a 50 yard dash. So think about what kind of exercise you do at the gym. If you're doing primarily cardio that's taking like 30 or 40 minutes on the treadmill, you're probably using more of these fibers. If you're just doing weightlifting, you're probably using more of your fast glycolytic fibers. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some terms that apply to the muscular system. And those terms are atrophy and hypertrophy. So atrophy, first of all, is a wasting away of muscle tissue, and it occurs either because we've severed a nerve or because we're not using it anymore. So think about your friends in high school and stuff like that, and you know, there's really big guys that are on the football team, they play for Kahuku or, or whatever team they're playing for, they're just like in the gym every day, and how big and muscular they look right now, and then look at their dads, okay? They were probably the same genetics and stuff like that. Over time, if you don't use that muscle, you lose it. The muscle wastes away, gets converted to connective tissue, even adipose tissue. And once that happens, you can't gain those muscle fibers back. You can build up the ones you have left, uh, but you can't gain the ones back. On the other hand, hypertrophy is the opposite of atrophy. Hypertrophy is greater than growth, right? So we see people with hypertrophic muscle growth that are bodybuilders, right? This is Arnold Schwarzenegger back in his day. There are some cows and dogs that have been bred to be super muscular. I don't know why. Uh, but the point is hypertrophy is a greater than normal uh, growth of muscle. In humans, it means we've probably been working out a lot, maybe using some steroids, etc. All right, so I said we're not gonna spend a lot of time in class talking about the different muscles in the body. There's over 800 of them, so we don't really have time to learn them, but I do wanna talk about a few concepts that involve muscles and muscle groups. The first term here is something called synergists. So synergy means to work together. So we have a lot of muscles in the body that individually do work together. I'll show you some examples. 
So here is our muscle mannequin right here, right? And we know the muscle in the upper arm here is called the biceps or the biceps brachii. Well, the biceps brachii helps to move the arm like this. It helps to flex the arm. And it has other muscles under there called the brachialis that also aid in that contraction. So those two muscles would be called synergists. On the other hand, we also have antagonistic muscles. Remember that muscles can only forcefully shorten. They can't forcefully extend. So what muscle helped me to flex my arm? Right? That was my biceps brachii. So the question is, what muscle helps me to extend my arm? It's not my biceps. Where is it? Well, if you said triceps, you're correct. The triceps brachii is on the opposite side of the joint, and it contracts in order to extend the arm. So up here we have biceps brachii and triceps brachii. Because they have opposite motor movements, they are called muscle antagonists. OK, we have antagonistic muscles elsewhere as well. So take a look at the muscles there in the jaw. I'm going to move you out of the way. And I want you to find these on your own body. So the muscle up top there is the temporalis muscle. It is connected up here on the temporal bone, and it connects down here to the mandible, the jaw bone. So big muscle right there attaches here to the jaw bone. And its job is to close the jaw. The other muscle I want to point out is something called the lateral pterygoid. We can see that right there. So it looks like it originates uh, right there on the zygomatic arch and inserts again on the mandible. Its job is to open the jaw. So which one of those two muscles do you think is stronger? Or are they both the same? Well, you can probably look at this one and be like, oh, obviously the temporalis is stronger. And that's true. Your jaw closing muscles, your chewing muscles, are much stronger than your opening muscles. And I didn't know this until I took physiology. It didn't make sense. I remember looking at the TV and looking at somebody like Steve Irwin, crocodile hunter. I know this is not him. And you're watching that guy wrestling the crocodile. And you're like, oh, Steve Irwin, he's so strong. He can hold that crocodile's mouth shut. Well, the point is the crocodile's jaw opening muscles are just about as weak as our own jaw opening muscles. So you can do this actually very easily. I remember if I lived in South Carolina, we actually had alligators who would wander into town sometimes. And they would usually just take some duct tape and you know, wrap up their mouths because the jaw opening muscle is very weak, but the jaw closing muscle is very strong. So it would be hard for this guy, the same guy, to keep those jaws from closing once they were open, but very easy to hold them closed uh, once they are closed. OK, you've reached the end of the lecture on muscle tissue and muscle physiology. Again, I'm hoping to spend some time with you in class doing an activity involving muscle contraction and muscle functions. I'm just still waiting to hear from your teachers on what that activity is going to look like. But I'm hoping we can work on that together. Meanwhile, if you have any questions about the lecture, you can send me an email or a text. And I've also included some links on this PowerPoint, which is available on the website. If you want to click on the animations and see what a sliding filament hypothesis looks like, etc. As always, if you have any questions, send me an email or drop me a text. Talk to you soon.